My name is Sanjay Gupta and I am a cardiologist in York. Today's video is on the subject of pulse pressure. This is an interesting uh, parameter that can give us uh, very helpful information about the overall state of our cardiovascular health. Now, blood pressure is usually expressed in two sets of values. For example, if you have a blood pressure reading, it'll usually say something like 120 over 80. The 120 refers to the systolic blood pressure. This is the pressure in the blood vessels when the heart is contracting. It is always the higher value. The 80 in the 120 over 80 refers to the diastolic pressure, the pressure in the blood vessels when the heart is relaxing, and hence the diastolic pressure is always the lower value of the two. Now, if you subtract the diastolic number from the systolic number, you get a third value, and this is called the pulse pressure. And this is a reading that can provide even more information about the overall health of our cardiovascular system. Uh, so if your systolic blood pressure is 120 and your diastolic is 80, then your pulse pressure is 120 minus 80 equals 40. In general, if the pulse pressure is less than 25% of the higher reading, the systolic pressure, then it is considered to be low. And if the pulse pressure is more than 100 millimeters of mercury, then it is considered to be high. So in our example, if the blood pressure was 120 over 100, then the pulse pressure is 20, which is less than 25% of the systolic reading, and then it would be considered low. On the other hand, if the blood pressure was 120 over 15, then the pulse pressure would be considered excessively large or wide because it is above 100. Different conditions may cause the pulse pressure to be too low or too high. But to understand how these conditions affect the pulse pressure, we have to first understand the systolic and diastolic pressures because calculation of the pulse pressure is dependent on the systolic and the diastolic pressures. Um, I'll go into this in more detail, but in essence, any condition that increases systolic pressure without concomitantly increasing diastolic pressure or any condition that reduces diastolic pressure without reducing the systolic pressure will lead to an increased pulse pressure and vice versa. Let's see what factors govern systolic pressure first. Now, I love this analogy and the analogy is of uh, inflating a balloon. Think of inflating a balloon. So you've got the balloon and you blow in it. Now, during systole, the heart is ejecting blood into our blood vessels. So it's a little bit like us blowing into this balloon. So the pressure in the balloon, the pressure in our blood vessels during systole, when we're actually pushing blood in, is governed by the heart rate, how much blood is pumped out with each heartbeat. This is also called the stroke volume, the viscosity of the blood, and also the elasticity of the blood vessels. So if we um, think of inflating the balloon, the pressure in that balloon will be dependent on how fast we're blowing in, how much we're blowing in with each breath, what we're blowing in, you know, the viscosity of what we're blowing in, and the stretchability of the balloon. If we blow with more speed and vigor, the pressure goes up much higher. If the balloon itself is not very stretchable, then the pressure will be much higher within the balloon, right? So if the balloon isn't very stretchable, whatever you're doing will cause a much higher pressure within the balloon because the balloon is not stretching to accommodate that extra effort. Exactly the same applies to our vascular system. If we have nice stretchy blood vessels, then the systolic pressure will not be as high as if it would be if we had stiff blood vessels. So a rise in heart rate during exercise or stress, aging of our blood vessels uh, due to, you know, with, which causes increased stiffness, increased viscosity of blood, or simply having too much blood, such as when we're taking a high salt diet, will increase the systolic pressure. Now let's think of diastolic pressure. Now, during diastole, the heart is relaxing and the aortic valve, which is the valve which allows, which opens to allow the blood to pump blood out into these blood vessels is actually closed. So the pressure in diastole is not governed by the heart anymore. It's not dependent on what's going on in the heart because the heart is actually, uh, the valve is closed. So when we are looking at diastolic pressure, 
the diastolic pressure is not really controlled by the heart rate or the stroke volume because that's not what's happening in diastole. In diastole, the pressure is largely governed by the elastic recoil of the blood vessels themselves. Now imagine that balloon again. Okay, let's assume you've finished blowing into it and have now tied it up. The pressure in that balloon, uh, when it is tied up like that, the pressure within it is determined by the elasticity of the walls of the balloon. So if they are recoiling, then the pressure would be high. If the balloon walls have good elasticity, they will exert a greater pressure. If the walls are stiff, then they exert less pressure. You can easily demonstrate this. Let go of the balloon and see how it flies off. That flying, it's flying off because of this recoil of the, the balloon walls pushing the air out. A stretchy balloon will fly off and go much further compared to a stiffer balloon because the elastic recoil is greater and therefore there is a higher diastolic pressure. So that's how you understand, that's how we understand diastolic pressure. So what do the systolic and diastolic pressures tell us? Well, the systolic pressure is the highest pressure that our blood vessels are going to be exposed to, and therefore this is the number which, if excessively high, is most likely to do us damage. Out of the systolic and the diastolic, the systolic is more important. And that is what doctors try to manipulate favorably to reduce the deleterious impact of blood pressure on our bodies. The diastolic pressure is also important, but less important than the systolic pressure. The diastolic pressure tells us about the stretchability of our blood vessels and therefore the health of our blood vessels. It is important that the diastolic pressure is, does not fall too low because even during diastole, we need a certain amount of blood to be in our brains and in our heart vessels. And if the diastolic pressure falls too low, then this may increase the risk of falls due to lack of blood to the brain and may even reduce the amount of blood getting into our heart vessels. So the pulse pressure, therefore, gives us incremental information because it's combining the information that you get from the systolic pressure, which is about the highest pressure our blood vessels are going to be exposed to. That's the number that does us harm. And it combines information about the diastolic pressure, which tells us about the health of our vascular system and why we develop blood pressure in the first place. You know, stiff vessels, how uh, widespread is the stiffness? Let's uh, look at, to try and understand pulse pressure, let's look at how aging affects pulse pressure. Okay, as we age, our blood vessels tend to get stiffer. So our balloon is getting stiffer and therefore when you try and blow uh, air into a stiff balloon, the pressure will go up much higher. That is systolic pressure. So the systolic pressure goes up when we age. What happens to our diastolic pressure when we age? Well, initially our tiny vessels start stiffening. And then as the stiffness becomes more widespread, even the larger vessels become stiff. So in the early stages, the elastic recoil in our large vessels is maintained, but the small vessels are stiff and therefore the pressure goes up because the large vessel is still recoiling, but the, the smaller vessels have become stiff. So the pressure has gone up because this pressure, the, the, the blood cannot escape as easily and therefore the pressure in the vessel remains high. So as you get older, initially the systolic pressure goes up and the diastolic pressure goes up, but as the stiffness becomes more widespread and progresses from the tiny vessels to the bigger vessels, the bigger vessels start losing their recoil because they're losing their elasticity. And now you have nothing which is compressing that, you know, so you've now got a stiff balloon. You let go of that balloon, it's not going to fly off. And therefore the diastolic pressure starts falling. So until the age of about 50, both our systolic and diastolic will increase. But after this, the systolic continues to go up and the diastolic actually starts to fall and the pulse pressure increases. So patients who have more advanced or premature aging of their blood vessel will develop a wider or a higher pulse pressure with a high systolic and a low diastolic. Unfortunately, as doctors, when we detect a high systolic, our knee-jerk reaction is, oh, let's start the patient on blood pressure medications, which unfortunately also has the effect of lowering the diastolic further, and that therefore increases the risk of falls, and possibly also 
that reduces the amount of blood getting into our coronary arteries. And therefore, it's not uncommon for people who have high blood pressure. You know, they get given blood pressure tablets and then they present to their casualty department having suffered a fall. Most people worry about high systolic and high diastolic readings, but it is actually very low diastolic readings that are far more concerning compared to higher readings. This is why pulse pressure gives us more useful information compared to just looking at the systolic and the diastolic. The effects of a wide pulse pressure on overall morbidity and mortality have been assessed in several studies. Multiple trials have suggested that there is an increased risk of coronary disease, heart failure, stroke, and all-cause mortality when the pulse pressure is above 80 millimeters of mercury. There was a big study called the Framingham Heart Study, which suggested that for each uh, increase of 10 millimeters of mercury in pulse pressure, there was an increased 23% increased risk of developing coronary artery disease. And with each 16 millimeter mercury rise, in pulse pressure, there was a 55% increased risk of developing heart failure. These associations were unrelated to age or initiation of antihypertensive treatment during the follow-up period. There was another trial which suggested that an 11% increase in risk of strokes and a 16% increased risk of all-cause mortality for every 10 millimeter of mercury rise in pulse pressure. Interestingly, it also appears that patients who have a narrow pulse pressure are at a lower risk, suggesting that narrow pulse pressure may be protective in terms of cardiovascular mortality. Wide pulse pressure has also been independently found to be associated with an increased risk of developing atrial fibrillation. So for every 20 millimeter increase in pulse pressure, there's a 28% increased risk of developing atrial fibrillation. And again, this relationship is independent of other values such as systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Wide pulse pressure has also been shown to hasten decline of kidney function in patients who already have compromised kidneys. So the next question then is, well, what do you do about it? You know, it's a value, you find it, well, what do you do about it? Well, most medications that are given for blood pressure tend to reduce the systolic and the diastolic as well, but they may not actually reduce the pulse pressure because they may reduce the systolic uh, and the diastolic equally, and therefore the pulse pressure doesn't get any less. And in fact, one could argue that reducing the systolic blood pressure pharmacologically comes with the cost of reducing the diastolic pressure, which is exactly what you want to avoid. And if we look at trial data, and there was a trial called the TNT trial, and I'll find some references and put them on my website. So, uh, you know, there'll be a transcript of whatever I'm saying on my website. Uh, if we look at trial data uh, from the TNT trial, it appears that the risk of cardiovascular events and adverse clinical outcomes actually increases when you try and reduce the diastolic reading to below 85 millimeters of mercury. So perhaps medications which actually reduce the pulse pressure may work better than taking medications that just reduce the systolic and the diastolic reading. I don't think there's any really good, good evidence at this point in time to say that we should be hitting the diastolic hard. And actually more evidence points to the fact that you don't want to hit the diastolic readings hard. Um, and so the next question then is, are there any medications which work better in terms of reducing pulse pressure compared to the others? And there have been some studies looking at this. And in general, thiazide diuretics such as hydrochlorothiazide, um, and also nitrates seem to work better at reducing pulse pressure compared to more commonly used blood pressure lowering medications such as beta blockers. There was a study also by um, a scientist called Williams, Williams et al, which suggested that folic acid supplementation was superior to placebo at improving stretchability of blood vessels and reducing pulse pressure. The question is, why is all this important anyways? Why am I telling you about this? Well, the, the reason is that the pulse pressure reminds us that it is not just enough for us to control our systolic blood pressure with tablets. We need to improve the general health and stretchability of our blood vessels and keep, uh, keep our diastolic blood pressures uh, a little bit higher rather than let them fall as happens when we age. Uh, 
And so it's important not just to concentrate on taking tablets, but the, the health of our vascular system is largely going to be uh, dependent on our lifestyle. So there are no really effective tablets which are going to make our blood vessels healthy. The tablets are simply masking the numbers. They're just making the numbers look pretty. Uh, the most effective way of improving the health of our blood vessels is through lifestyle. So diet, avoidance of excessive sugar, avoidance of processed and refined foods, avoiding smoking, regular exercise, improved sleep patterns, and most importantly, stress management. Our health is in our hands and nature provides us with the most effective treatments. Once again, I hope you found this useful. It's a little bit of a complex subject. I hope I haven't made it too complicated, um, but do let me know. I will post a transcript of this video on my website as promised, www.drsanjayguptacardiologist.com and I'll make sure that there's a reference available. So if you want to explore the subject of pulse pressure in more detail, you can access it there. I wish you all the best. Take care.